So uh, I'm going to be coming at a presentation from a completely different angle. Uh, I'm a CPO, Chief Product Officer at Clue, and I come from a design background. Uh, so I'm not a traditional product manager. Uh, as I've learned slowly over the, t over the course of working at Clue, I'm one of the co-founders also. Uh, so we're switching now gears from finance to female health, uh, and I can answer a lot of questions about that also. Uh, but first I would like to get a raise of hands. How many people in here are designers? So I come from a design background, and how many people have a research background, like uh, generative research, ethnography, anything like that? So I'm going to be, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, there we go. OK. Uh, so I'm going to be going over research methodology and product strategy, uh, and how uh, research fits into product strategy, and also kind of in a lot of ways an opposite approach to the fail fast, fail early model, uh, I'm going to be focused on strategy so that you don't have to fail. Uh, and that's what, I'll, that's what this presentation is mostly about. There we go. So this is Clue, two screens from Clue. Clue is a health tracker for women. And it allows women to track different aspects of their health, different symptoms that they're having, and learn about their cycle, and learn when something might be wrong. So this is what period trackers looked like before uh, Clue entered the market. Uh, and, uh, but this is a lot what's wrong with uh, anything that's designed for the, uh, the category of female health, is that they tend to treat everybody like uh, they're still in their teen years. And so Clue uh, took the different approach, which was to treat everybody like an adult, including the teen users of Clue. Uh, and this was one of the first quotes that we got from a review. <laughs> And if you don't know what My Little Pony is, that's My Little Pony. So most of the time we're thinking about things like this, which is pretty deep into science. And we have people that are doing uh, research for us. Uh, we have a researcher here in the audience for, who's from the, the Clue team. Uh, we have academic partners uh, from Oxford University, Stanford, Columbia, and New York. And so we're doing hard research. We're doing research, that uh, hard science research. And we're trying to advance female health. And we are... Um, this actually is a quote from today. And this has now happened quite a few times over the past three and a half years, where somebody, because they're now tracking health, uh, their health and tracking their symptoms, and because they have a product that's easy to use and they use it consistently, they were able to find out that they had a problem. And uh, this, specifically the ectopic pregnancies, are ones that we hear about uh, regularly where people are like, thank you, you saved my life. Now, I, I would say usability saved their life because Clue was easy enough to use to where they used it consistently enough. Um, and we're always happy to, to hear uh, stories like this. Uh, we are a mission-driven company. So we are focused on creating advances for female health globally. And so we are globally focused as well. We're not just focused on developed markets, but we, will, uh, we have uh, bigger ambitions than that. We are also female founded, which I think is important from a, uh, just from a, uh, where is the heart of the company coming from? And the, the balance of the company is uh, split somewhere around 70, 30%, 70% uh, women, 30% men. Uh, and then this is a picture of the last summer offsite that we had, uh, and some of the people are actually here. Uh, I wanted to tell a brief story. Uh, this maybe seems completely out of context, and it kind of is. Uh, <laughs> But I grew up in the United States, and I grew up in uh, the countryside. So uh, when you uh, grow up in the US and you get your driver's license, it's kind of a big deal because it's freedom for you. For the first time, you're able to get, you know, jump in the car and go away and be independent on your own. And uh, the first time I was allowed to take the car and go for a ride alone was to buy pads and tampons for my mom and sister. <laughs> so that was the inspiration for my mom saying, yeah, just go. And, and so that's a bit of the connection. So in my family, uh, my mom was a nurse. And when my sister had her first period, it was not unusual. We talked about it in the car rides that we were having. We talked about it at home. And health was just a topic. And what, I, what was strange to me uh, is that female health uh, 
it has a lot of taboos around it. People don't talk about menstruation. They don't talk about periods. They don't talk about fertility. Don't talk about uh, unwanted pregnancies, abortions, miscarriages, all of these topics. They're just not part of our, our normal dialogue. And so a lot of what we're doing is we're opening up these topics uh, for conversation. We have about uh, somewhere around 100 pages of scientifically valid uh, text in Clue where someone can learn about different aspects of female health. Uh, so there's a lot uh, going on with Clue, not just a tracking app. So what I'm here to talk about uh, is this, uh, what is a different style diagram from what uh, was presented earlier, is what is the process like to get to the vision? So this target here is the vision. And uh, I'm going to be focused on the left-hand side over here, which is about how to avoid the pitfalls of failed products and uh, obstacles that you have uh, as, you're, as you're building the product. And so the product here is represented with a, with a, as a present, which I'll explain a little bit more. So I'm talking about insight-driven product uh, development. Uh, so we focus on looking at the market, identifying insights and opportunities based on some kind of market research. Uh, some of that is just talking to hundreds of people over the past 300, uh, sorry, hundreds of people over the past three and a half years. That would be a, a very long time for an app to be in the market. Uh, and uh, it's really about how to Collect insights that allow you to point in a direction that allow you to be more successful with your iterations uh, so that you don't have to iterate as often. You get a little bit nerdy on the research side, but I expect that probably have a lot of questions afterwards about this if you can remember any of these uh, fancy words. But uh, there's three different types of research in general, formative, generative, and evaluative. Formative research is what allows you to understand what's happening in the marketplace. So for example, with female health, it would be reading health textbooks, for example, uh, talking to OBGYNs, uh, talking to medical researchers, and really understanding in depth and in breadth what's going on with female health to understand what the rest of the market isn't doing. So there's a, 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 no attention really paid to competitors at this point, and we don't pay a whole lot of attention to competitors because we have a very different approach to how we're doing our work. So we don't base our ideas off of what our competitors are doing. We're basing our, our, our product development off of what the, what the market needs. And so what we're focused on, the formative research, is identifying what the market needs are. Generative research, then, is after the opportunity has been identified, and then you do research to create new ideas from. So how do you generate new ideas? So you have an insight then for a product or a feature, and that allows you to then generate new ideas. And then evaluative are the type of research that most people are familiar with, I think, which is more focused on after you have a thing, how do you improve the thing? How do you measure whether or not it's performing well? And then how do you iterate it? So the easy trick to remember is before you build, someone, uh, before you build something, talk to somebody. So you gather information before you build something. So the building process itself is ex expensive in time uh, and with resources. So you're better off trying to identify what's the right thing to build before you start building something. And then there's a difference between qualitative and quantitative uh, research. Qualitative is, uh, is about ideas, it's about concepts, it's about um, uh, feelings and emotions, uh, needs, uh, unmet needs. Qua Qualitative is more something that you can measure and express in numbers. So how well is something performing? Um, how long do people stay on different screens? How do the flows work? Uh, things like that. So it's measurable, it's quantifiable, and that's quanti quantitative. So as we, in the previous presentation, we were talking about fail fast, fail often. I'm actually not definitely talking about that. I'm talking about uh, how to get better, faster, stronger market fit without the fail fast. So market fit, um, this is the textbook definition, the degree to which a product satisfies a strong market demand. And then to go into that, then what do I mean by better when I say uh, better, faster, stronger? Better I th is about empathy. It's being empathetic. It's about really understanding uh, who you're designing for and who you're creating it, who you're creating it for. So I like to think about the things that we're creating as a gift. It's a present. So if you were just shopping for somebody that you don't know, you re really wouldn't know what to get them. And so here we're talking about really getting to know somebody at such a level that you know what to give them. So what is the thing that you're trying to create? What is the thing that will, that will satisfy their, their needs? 
By faster, I'm talking explicitly about reduced iterations. I'm not talking about uh, velocity, development or engineering velocity. So how do you reduce iterations so that you get the thing that you put into the market uh, has a better chance of success so that you don't have to rebuild it over and over again? Uh, and we've had pretty good success with this approach so far at Clue. We have had only a couple, one relatively dramatic uh, thing that we invested in quite a bit uh, that we that we pulled, uh, that we, well, that hasn't been performing well. We haven't decided exactly what to do with it. And that was a result of not doing quantitative analysis on something that was qualitatively defined. So by stronger, and this is another one of these uh, strange visualizations that I put in here, uh, but stronger is about creating something for a genuine unmet need. A lot of startups, a lot of products are more of just an idea that somebody has, and then they put it into the market, see, see how it, you know, if it works or not, generally it doesn't, and then figuring out how you go from there. And this for me is more like product strategy uh, in, uh, in reverse. So you, you make something, to define your product strategy instead of having a product strategy that tells you what you should build. So going into detail on better and developing empathy. Uh, this was one of the first questions that was asked by me when I, uh, after we launched uh, when uh, I was at a, at a conference. And uh, the question was, what do women want? And I was immediately confused because I was like, well, how do you even begin to answer this question? Uh, and I was a little bit offended even by the question. I didn't even know why I was offended. So I decided to start unpacking this uh, the question. And the first thing is to say, well, what is woman? What do we mean when we actually say that? And so uh, traditionally what you would do with this segment, a very large segment, three and a half billion people on the planet, uh, would be, so you segment it by, based on age and maybe you plot people on an age, you know, and so you have your traditional segmentation. You go from, you know, the teens to the, to the tweens, to the young adult, to the adult, to the midlife, uh, to the uh, older age. And then you, you may uh, decide that you want to plot another uh, vector. Uh, it's about uh, what the life goals are. So trying to get pregnant, trying to avoid getting pregnant. And then here you're talking about maybe different relationship types that people have, uh, different uh, sexualities, different genders, things like that. And it gets messy pretty quickly, but you, know, you can you know, break that up and segment people based off of that. Uh, and then you realize that everybody's in motion, right? Because if you're trying to understand, you know, humans, they, they change. And it gets quite complicated pretty fast. But this would be an example of formative research. So the first uh, type of research that I was describing. So really understanding a market in depth and actually digging into all of those topics in depth and developing this empathetic understanding of what the, the, you know, the lives are of all these people. So now the faster part. Uh, and this is where we get into how to avoid uh, the, the failure. So the little monsters here, the obstacles and the tombstones there are the failed, uh, the failed features. So the, my background uh, has been in product strategy for about 15 years. So I uh, had been a consultant uh, for a long time. I was at Frog Design as a creative director uh, and did a lot of work for Fortune 500 companies. And most of what they were looking for, those companies, is they were trying to figure out what they could build with the lowest risk possible. What was the thing that would guarantee them success? So they had these uh, huge, you know, they would ask us to do these huge research projects that would start uh, from uh, doing, uh, talking to, uh, I, think, uh, I think the largest one I did was 120 people, different segments, uh, all, all over different parts of the world, identify like what's the next generation XYZ, what is the next generation mobile phone, what is the next generation killer app, any of these things. And they all would produce generally pretty solid results. They're very heavy documentation focused processes and the research also. Uh, and so the question is how do you take the, for me anyway, was how to take those processes, break them down uh, into very small tools that you could apply in something that's a lot like a design sprint. So generally, uh, what happens with the traditional approach, the fail fast method, is to build all hypotheses. You just build every, th every hypothesis that you have until you get the one that sticks. And what we're doing is instead you build after evaluating your hypotheses. So you discover what your hypotheses are. That's based off of the formative research, sometimes off of generative research also. And then you evaluate those and you figure out what's the, what's the thing that has the best chance of succeeding. So instead of then encountering all these areas of failure, you have a direction to go that has the best chance of success. So the things that you build are less likely to fail. Uh, I wanted to go into uh, 
generative research, so that was an example of generative research. Uh, getting into now the topic of stronger, and I'm going to talk about a very different, so this is the uh, part of the uh, presentation where I'm going into in depth into a method, uh, research method that uh, developed for Clue, just because it was, if you can imagine trying to then develop a product for three and a half billion people, not, it's a bit of a challenge if you're trying to base that off of a segmented approach, right? So if you segment, segment all of those people, um, it's not going to work. So it's called spectrum research because then you're talking about a spectrum of people, a broad a range of people, and there are no boundaries between those people. You kind of remove the boundaries between people. Uh, a key component of this is something I call factors of diversity. So all of those things that were used in that original segmentation model to divide people are instead used to define the boundaries of the people that you're creating something for. So these are some of the factors of diversity that we're, uh, that, that we're looking at all the time and we're evaluating our new uh, concepts against. And so there are life stages, birth control types, relationship types, gender, sexualities, body perceptions, reproductive goals, medical conditions, education levels, impairments, it goes on and on. And all of these are plurals. So there are five to 10 things behind each of these bullet points and there are actually more bullet points also. So there end up being a lot of things. So uh, as a visualization, these are um, not, uh, probably we have about double uh, the, the actual count of dots that are up there on the screen, but if you can think about then this defining the boundaries of the people that you're talking to. So instead of a segment, in traditional segmentation research, you would define a very specific type of person that you want to talk to and then try to find as many of those people as you can and very narrowly uh, talk to as consistently uh, that type of person as you can over and over and over again to get a consistent insight that you can then design for. Now that doesn't create a mass market product that creates a very uh, narrowly defined product, a, a product that's maybe designed for a single use case, uh, which is maybe suitable for a lot of apps. Uh, so this, but we're trying to create something that's mainstream, something that uh, works globally. And so we're really trying to understand all of these points of uh, variety, all these points of diversity, and then design something that applies to everybody. So after then plotting out this boundary between all of the people, around all of the people that you're uh, talking to, then you collect your insights. Insights are gathered from a variety of ways. It can be quantitative, qualitative. A lot of it is talking to people. As I mentioned, I've talked to hundreds of people uh, throughout the course of uh, Clue. And after collecting those insights, uh, then you connect the dots. So instead of talking to all these different segments and having these bucketed insights, you have one set of insights that apply very broadly to everybody. And it takes time. Uh, and it takes talking to a lot of people. You can do it fast, and then you just keep adding diversity into it. So it's a kind of long, a long-form type of research. So it starts with a small sprint, and then you just keep adding and adding and adding to your knowledge base as you go. Uh, this is what, uh, and this is not how we do it, uh, but this is a typical analysis uh, uh, process. So lots of post-it notes, and there's a very specific way to do it. You can see that there's numbers in the upper right-hand corners. They're tagged, they're coded with different keywords, and then you sort them different ways. You tag them again, you sort them uh, again into groups and clusters, and those are your insights that, that uh, you use. Now, if you can imagine, if you had segmented all these people, you would have multiples of these, many more multiples of these, which would make it a lot harder. So if you keep the boundary, if you define the boundary of the people that you're talking to and then focus on speaking to as diverse a number of people as possible, you get those insights that connect people instead of having insights about people who are separated, that you artificially separated. So spectrum research increases diversity to find patterns that connect people, while segmented research emphasizes simplicity so patterns are easier to find. And this is a counterintuitive approach at first, but once you think about it, it's just, you're just not dividing people. Uh, and instead, you're looking for diversity and you recruit diversity. There's some, uh, aspects of it that are a little bit harder in the analysis uh, stage, which I've documented and I wrote an article about this approach. Um, it's on Medium. Uh, there it is. It's on Medium. Um, and I have my, uh, my handle at the end of the presentation. So if you want more information, you can check it out. I can also uh, help answer any questions at the end of this. This is also a form of formative research. Uh, it also gives you uh, a good foothold into how to design your generative research and also your evaluative research. So. That's it. Um, I like to say that uh, all these processes are meant to be broken. So what sounds like a, maybe a complex process 
uh, is meant to be uh, broken up into the pieces that you find that you can use. Uh, and uh, it should never be seen as a, uh, as a process that is something that you can't adapt and make into something that, that, that's for yourself and for your company and for your team, capabilities of your team. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the speech. Um, so you talked about getting information from the market and getting into depth of what data you can get. How do you apply the same approach if you've got a very innovating product where there's no data or close to no data on the market? Yeah, give me an example. What do you... Uh... <clears throat> I don't know, some new technology that has been out there just recently and you've got an idea to use that, t t that technology in a product. Yeah, how do, so how, what data would you be using? Well, th then you're uh, looking for, a, then you have a technology that's looking for a need. And that's a uh, difficult type of innovation to do because if you don't have, uh, say for example, uh, there's a new sensor in the market. And then you have to figure out then what is a way to apply that sensor, right? And, and create usefulness around it. Uh, there's no easy way to do that. So you, uh, but generally there would be, you would, you'd look at different industry segments. I've done some of this type of research. You'd look for different opportunities at a very high level, different industry segments. So you might say, okay, this sensor is maybe useful for uh, um, uh, sports medicine, for example. Maybe it's useful in the military. Maybe it's useful uh, in medical purposes, uh, in medicine. And so then based off of that, depending on you know, the team that you've got, if you're looking for, and the type of monetization strategy that you have, uh, the kind of company that you want to build, then you would then focus on which opportunity seems like the best fit for you. And then you would identify the people who would be using it, and then you would go from there. Um, yes, so I thought it was really interesting. And um, when you said build after evaluating hypothesis, and I was just wondering how do you evaluate them? Because I guess that's then the hardest part of it, right? Because that's the point where you prioritize and say what is worth what or like, how's that process organized? I think you're a plant. You're sitting next to the person who could actually answer that really well. Tina, can so, you please uh, help me? <laughs> <laughs> Tina's one of our product managers back there. Hi, Tina. <laughs> so uh, it depends on what level we're talking about. So in terms of opportunity, right, what is the large opportunity that we're going after? Um, that would be defined based on um, what's happening in the market, uh, what the user needs are, you know, and, and a lot of this is unspoken, so latent needs. So people, things that people don't know that they want until, ah, it's there and of like, oh, how come nobody ever did this before? Mm -hmm. And, and that's those are really the breakthroughs that you're looking for, and we're working on some of those right now. And those were identified through a lot of the research that's been already done. Uh, a lot of these opportunities and some of these uh, features, I mean, I've written, I don't know how many uh, feature, uh, uh, creative briefs, right, for, for new features. Uh, for, for, for whole new areas of the app, and um, they, they, they wait for prioritization. Mm -hmm. Now the prioritization comes when there's a trigger in the market that says that it's like, now is a good time to do it. It comes from uh, our technical capabilities are you know, uh, have grown enough to now we can take that on. Uh, uh, for example, uh, particularly good data, data analysis, uh, machine learning, something like that. So it makes, a, makes actually pursuing something possible that we couldn't have done before. Um, and then also what's achievable in a short time frame. So uh, what is that MVP? What is the smallest thing that we can build that, that proves whether or not that bigger opportunity that we're reaching for is actually valid? So a lot of what we're focused on is saying, okay, that's the thing that we want. It's way in the future. Uh, but what is the thing that we can build right now, the smallest thing that we can build right now that allows us to know if we should even go there? And so we, we we say, okay, that's a really big opportunity. We think it's a game changer for us. And now we're going we're gonna to define the smallest little piece of value that we can create for the user, put it out there, see if they like it, and then build from that. So, uh, but, for, yeah, prioritization process, I think it's something that we're getting better at all the time. I think we've done a, the, the we got to a point with Clue where 
basically a lot of the research that I've been talking about happened at the very beginning, you know, when we founded the company together. And we have been building off of that same set of insights for a, re for a long time. And that proved to be the right approach. And now we're getting into uh, more of the, we're trying to change the game. So the competitors have maybe a similar feature set, and now we're trying to move, o move into a space where uh, the competition is, uh, can't really catch us. Uh, by by prioritizing things that create this competitive differentiation and based on things that are difficult to replicate as well. Uh, we're focused very much on growth uh, right now, so anything that achieves, uh, that helps us achieve growth. So we prioritize now things that are uh, emphasize acquisition uh, or retention. And so that's a, a big part of what we're pri uh, how we prioritize everything right now. And if it doesn't hit one of those targets, then we don't work on it. Hi. Um, you spoke very broadly about um, two different ways to find patterns. Um, so, you know, speaking to a very wide and diverse group and find patterns to apply to all and um, segment them and find simple patterns. Since you've been working, as you said, in product management for 15 years, would you think like there's like the one is superior to the other or is it specifically for Clue now because you have such a broad customer base that you prefer this approach you have now? Or would you say it's, so is it specific to Clue, or is it something you would apply to more projects or projects you've done in the past as well? Well, uh, Clue is my first startup, right? So the work that I was doing before was much, mostly Fortune 500. So I wouldn't say that I would take this method, I actually would take this method and apply it back to the Fortune 500 problem, uh, but I don't think that they could move that quickly. Right? So the methods that we have right now allow us to go very quickly using some of these uh, tools that create really deep insights into the market. Uh, even when a, uh, one of those bigger clients has uh, the need for that insight, they have a very difficult time taking action on it because usually it's disruptive to their business and they don't know how to disrupt their own business. Um, and one example of this is uh, work that uh, doing in uh, Asia for a, a, one of the biggest telcos in Asia. And uh, they were like, what's the next thing? What's the next big, what's the killer, the next killer app? Uh, what's going to be the game changer like the iPhone was the game changer? And this was, uh, this was actually before the iPhone, quite a bit before. And this was before uh, when there was just SMS and there wasn't even uh, messaging clients that are available on mobile phones. And so what we proposed to them was a many-to-many -many group messaging. Um, and they couldn't handle it because, uh, and they asked for a billion-dollar opportunity. Like literally, they, had, they said it had to monetize at a billion in order for that to be worth to invest in. And so we did the financial models. We said that, yes, this is a big opportunity. Here are the market trends that say that this is the, real, this is the right thing to do. But they couldn't do it uh, because they were afraid it would take away their revenue from SMS, right? Now, of course, that happened anyway. You know, so the, 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 the forecast was correct, but they couldn't actually do it because they couldn't change their very big business to take advantage of that opportunity. So. I think until these large companies uh, learn to operate in a more agile way, move more quickly, these tools aren't as useful. Uh, but the ones that are having more success are the ones who are doing these more innovation spin-offs. So they have a group that operates more like a startup that's outside of the, age, uh, the, the company and operates independently. Um, but I would say that this approach probably fits to a lot of um, mainstream products. Uh, I would say that for sure. Yeah, the, the insight gathering, the market analysis, the um, the, uh, the the spectrum research in particular. There are other tools that apply. I think almost any, like the the generative research techniques, talking to users, gaining insights into unmet needs, things like that. Evaluative as well. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>